This is um, who knows, who cares, who goes, who dares. Segment number six of session two. I'd like to ask questions related to uh, finding a master or a relationship to a master. Do, do all beings seeking a master find one? D depends on what you mean. As a master, we reviewed this question earlier. It uh, depends on who and what the lessons are for the individual in terms of what they're ready for. So who's ready for the master? That's a big question. Who's ready for a master? And who's ready for the demands or the fire or the presence, the intelligence, the wisdom, the force, the love or heart of the master? Who's ready for that? Very few people are ready for that, in fact. People are ready for theories of that. People are ready to believe and uh, by remote, believe in the kind of uh, relationship uh, that uh, people uh, in this world have in terms of religious heroes of yesteryear, thousands of years old. And so they want to believe in a master. They don't want to be in the presence of fire of a real living master when in fact uh, that's the requirement. So it's not who is uh, in, let's say, relationship to um, a master who doesn't kick your ass, right? Uh, and who's in relationship to a master who is, you know, the fire uh, itself, right? Who uh, burns beyond description. So who's ready for that? That's a good question. Not too many people are, yes. So we don't have to spend too much time on that. I think that's self-explanatory, but people know through the media and through um, their own uh, experience with peeps, and, and especially those who are intuitive, they start to see through their religious association into what a real master is about. That's what they want. They want to be like the heroes that they look up to. They say, the only way to get there, because I'm obviously not ready to, to be like a Jesus or like a Buddha or whatever, whoever's out there, say, oh, how do I get to that? Now, are they going to help me to get to that if I'm going to be a part of their religion? And you see, you're not going to get to it by your religion. So how, how do you have contact with the one itself or one like that? That's really a good question for people. So, and are they willing to undergo the uh, ordeal of what it is requiring for you to become more like that, whatever that is? So, free to be as source is, be as fire is, be as the heart is, as free as the heart is. That's a very wild proposition. It's crazy. So, I think we can speculate as to who, under what conditions. But that depends on the person's lessons. So, the word is out there, straight, straight from, uh, from the earliest history. It's out there, they're always leaders. And what kind of leader? Depends on what your fancy is and what your requirements are. For some, it's to be masters of the world in terms of an occupation, a business, right? Others, it's to be master of the world in terms of selfless mastery, egoless participation in the ways of the heart, and it's, you know, love as such. So it really depends on the person, because the master is always here, and as they have said in the past, you know, uh, when the student's ready, the master appears, I've always changed that. When the master is ready, the student disappears. <laughs> Next. Uh, can you comment on the distinction, if any, between uh, a master and a mentor? Well, they can be the same thing. And then what I have taught is that you have many teachers. And then there's a master who lives, lives the life beyond teaching. There's no teaching. There's nothing you can say. When you, when you behold the way a real master is functioning. Not, not according to your eyeballs. What your eyeballs see is you looking at something. But what the master is, is beyond what your eyeballs see, it's beyond your mind, it's beyond your body, it's beyond your karma, it's beyond your past, it's beyond your experiences. It's way beyond perception. So then we have an idea, the mysterious ways that spirit works through certain people, and you, you just can't get it unless you are participant in that field where it's obvious to you who's doing what and why. 
beyond words, beyond reasoning, beyond understanding. You just know what it is, you recognize it perfectly, and you let it be. You don't get in its way. So that's what it is. Okay, oh, you have a teacher, a master? Fantastic. Not too many people have that. Good luck on your journey. Okay? You let it be that. For others, they have a lot of trials to undergo before they get ready for the, what the word could mean to them. Okay? Because, you know, word master means skill. It has all kinds of uh, mundane connotations, and all of those are valid. It means skillfulness. Okay? Master. One who is excellent. One who is quite capable, extraordinary, powerful, so on. Master. One who walks uh, in spirit. Most people don't even see it. Right? Master's one is in your face and you can't see it. You can't hear it. You can't recognize it. Master's that kind of silent being. Well, it's there, but you, you don't know it's there. You have no idea what's behind it, where it's coming from, and what appears to you is your mind. Your own mind is what appears. And yet the Master is a fire, and you know it when you're in touch with it, you know what it is, and it's a compelling force. There's no mistaking it. You're doubtless about what it is when it becomes more or less revealed to you as being what it is. So, so many are called, few are chosen. But of the few who are chosen, very few can realize what it is. Okay. Realize what it is because it's beyond your you. Okay. So you have to be beyond you in order for you to realize what it could be as what it is, what it could be for itself. And when an individual finds their master, do they give up or repudiate their teachers who've come before? Oh, you can. It doesn't matter. There are, if you find them, whatever they call the master, then there's no, there's nothing else. So, if you're properly aligned to that, you're not, you're not in some kind of a library. You're not in some kind of a, a hall where you're picking and choosing anything. So you not, you haven't found a master if you, if you're thinking about other things, in a sense. Okay? A master is, when you find a master, you find it for yourself. And when you find it for yourself, it becomes very clear what you have to do. And it's beyond your conversation, it's beyond your ego completely. As long as you're in the ego realm about it, you haven't found anything but something in yourself. Because okay? when you find a thing, then you, are, you don't have a self anymore. See? You have a reality. It's not self, it's beyond yourself. Then you have what we would call then contact with, association with, or the company or presence of the master. It's not anything uh, your ego knows. Yourself doesn't know it. Can't know it. And if yourself can't know it, and something in you knows it, it's related to the master, and that means you, your, your connection is again, as I said, you're not separate from it. You're part of it. If you're part of it, it's like it's like your leg. It's like your lungs. You can play any game of relationship you want with your lungs, you know, your heart and your breathing, but it's that close. It's that close. It's, it is it is the divine in a sense. It is the supreme in a sense. But yet it's, it, you can't describe it. You don't know what it is. Right? You just know. But you don't know what it is. But you know it is. But you don't know what it is. But you know it is. You don't, may not know who it is, but you know it is. The fact is, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why any conversation or thought or feeling or anything comes up relative to it, because it is what it is. And we know it's true. We, or some know it's true and it's real. It's all there is, in fact. So when the master then becomes reality, then it's real. If it's just a thing that you can kind of move around like a, like a piece on a chess table, <laughs> that's you. <laughs> the thing you can move around is you. It's you moving you around. <laughs> I hope you find the right place on the board. Right? You're not eating up too soon. Comments? Um, I guess it's a question related to that. Can, can one be in relationship to the Master, open to a Master, and yet still have their own views that might be uh, other than the Master's? Or is it a case of adherence? Well, then it depends, it depends on what, again, where you are relative to whatever the Master is. If you think the Master's views, you missed the boat completely. 
<laughs> then you're still preoccupied with the opiates. <laughs> right? Then the master still is this piece you move around on the chessboard. Right? You think it's working for you or something. Right? It's supposed to do something for you. Right? It's a self-serving, self-gratifying uh, delusion about what the master is relative to yourself. And I don't think that's what the process is. That's a little bit too much at the beginner's level. That's, uh, you know, for the pipsqueaks. Pip sweeps uh, there, you know, where you're thinking about the master, you have no clue what it is if you're just thinking about it. And if you have views, and it has views, if you limit it to a certain view that's different from your view, you haven't even got, you haven't put a key in the ignition yet. You're sitting in the car. <laughs> I hope you can get it started. <laughs> and get it going. Maybe you need a hand. Maybe somebody's got to come and help you push it. Right. Yeah, you might need a boost. <laughs> Next question. It is the goal of uh, a student in relationship to a master to become one themselves? Uh, if you want to become one, then you, you're not on the path. You see? Again, it's, it's really you, you once again pushing the pieces on the table for yourself. It's not, it's, you're thinking about, you're imagining what the master is, you have no clue as to what it is yet. So once you say, so that's it. It's just a thought process. You're in the theoretical stage of what, what a master is and maybe what you can be or not be. So, so there's a good comment. If a lot of people are there, they're, they're wondering, right? They're concerned with becoming. There's nothing to do with the master. The master is related to some of this, perhaps, but uh, master is, as I said earlier, like, like soul, awareness. It is. If it is, then everything else is off the table. Do all masters have masters themselves at some stage prior to becoming masters? Or? It, uh, it could be. It could be that way. It could be uh, something else. It depends, as I said. We go back to the original conversation uh, in terms of the first, first segment uh, where there was a conversation about, well, you know, everybody's different. Everyone has a different need, and it depends on what form it takes. So, uh, segment one included the conversation on the particular form it takes depending on the person. Whoever the person is, not the master, has nothing to do with that. So, yes, it is true that we are part of it. You, you can be a master, in a sense, but yet you have to master your life. You can't be one, right? And that's a question. How can you be a master, right? In that way, although you're here to do it. Everybody ultimately is here to be master. What do you have to do to really be beyond being a master? A master is beyond being a master. <laughs> Can one have two masters either at the same time or in succession? One can have a thousand or a million masters, it doesn't matter. But once you are in the presence of the master, then, then nothing else exists. So, so then you're still talking about peeps on this chessboard. These are still pieces you can move around. Well, I'm seeing this master, and I, I believe in this master because this master says things better, and this master looks a little better than that. This master has a whole better trip happening than that. And so I think I, I'll keep this master over here because it sounds hipper and it's more famous, and so it must be more valid. And, you know, it's all, it's all the same program. It has nothing to do with mastery whatsoever. It's about psychology. One's personal psychologic. Um, preoccupations with the subject of masters, plural, masters. And there's nothing wrong with it, nothing good about it, but it's a program. It has nothing to do with the master. Uh, it's outside of the master's house. Thanks. Uh, it seems that many people in relationship to a master or a guru uh, attribute things in their lives specifically to that guru or master. Um, oh, yes, that's very accident. real, very real. Sure, there's a lot you can attribute because it, if, if the master is, is that, uh, and obviously a spirit channel, whether you like it or not, whether you dig what they're doing or not, the force is there, and there are those who will say the force is definitely there because they are designated to see it more clearly and more powerfully than other people, and you can't argue with them. You know, it's like somebody has light in their eyes, what are they going to do, deny it? You can deny it, that's a program against the fact. So for others, yes, that, that's for real for you, 
and you, you can't escape it. You can't escape what it is. See? You can escape what it means. You can escape your interpretation of it. Uh, you can distance yourself from it as much as you want, but you can't escape what it is. What it is is a big question. Who knows? We don't know what the master is yet. See? So there are a lot of people who are totally configured with numbers of masters, but they don't know what the master is. And thus they are configured with numbers of masters. Does relationship to a master afford one protection in the physical world? Well, this oh, absolutely. Is... Absolutely. Again, it depends on what you understand. If you, if you recognize the presence of grace or fire, that speaks for itself. You feel that. You feel it. You go by the feeling. It's not imaginary. It's beyond the imagination. It's a, it's a very tangible, real, physical, almost like a physical force, but it doesn't show up as that to everybody else, because everybody's really different. And, and people don't know how different they are. And they say, well, those people can't be seeing anything because I don't see it. So they're deluded. Well, you might be deluded. And chances are you are deluded. <laughs> and wake up to that. Okay? Because this is a mysterious process that is an internal one. It's on the inside. So-called inside. It's in the inner world. The spiritual side of things. It's not, it's not physical. Okay? It's not always physical. Okay? And that's what you have to get beyond. You can say, well, you don't see it physically, but maybe you should try psychically. If you don't see it psychically, maybe you should try astrally. Maybe it's 100% the astral, and you can't even see a fraction of a percent. See, now other people are seeing it and responding to it because they're more astrally designed than you are. They might see it more in their dreams, they might see it more in their feelings, they might hear it more in the music, and then they, you know, for them they're done. It's, it's complete for them, it's perfect. Others won't see it. They can't. They're not designated, they're not purified enough to see it. It's not their time to see it. Maybe at some point they see it, hear it, feel it, as it is in the case of others. See? Good question. Um, it seems that a number of people who are considered as gurus or masters, uh, at least some, uh, exploit the people they're in relationship to, whether it's financially, sexually, or some other means. Uh, in my experience, you do none of these things. Uh, could, could you comment on that? Why should I? What's the fun in that? <laughs> I haven't found it to be fun yet. Once I discover it's fun, I do it. Maybe. But, but the point is, it's a guru that's exploited. It's never the other people. It would seem like that, but the guru is exploited. So people, why do people go to a, a guru if not to exploit it for what it is? So you set yourself up for that anyway. So it's really you. So I got nothing to do with the guru. It's like saying, well, I want to go into the zoo and I want to go sit with the bear. You know, I want to take pictures of the bears. I want to put it on my camera. So go in the bear's cage if you're there. And say, oh, then the bear just did this to me. Whoa, that's horrible. Wow, it almost killed me. Well, what the hell are you doing in the bear's cage? <laughs> The guru is a bear. You don't want to get in its cage, really. At least the kinds of teachers I would call a guru. You don't want to get in. The, you don't want to get in there with them like that. Huh? Things don't work according to yourself. So, so that's basically. I don't mean a, a guru. I don't mean this to mean that gurus are animals in that sense. No, but they're different. Different realities. If they have a certain kind of enlightenment, then they're not in your universe as a self. They're definitely not there. And you find out sooner or later that they're not there. They're just not there for you. They're not there for you. It's just like they, they, you can't see them, you can't hear them, you can't feel them. They don't hear you. Right? As such. Yeah. And in this case, if, if I were considered a guru or something, people can hear it in the music because the musicians hear something. Who knows what they hear? I don't know. I'm not trying to put anything on anybody or out there. It just is what it is. If it is, then it is. There's nothing you can take away from what is. It just is. It, it seems that there are some who use the appearances to create the idea that they're a master, but aren't in fact so. Is that something you would care to comment on? Yes. You have to know it. You have to have some standard, I guess you might say. Uh, there are, I think, established criteria for certain kinds of teachers and masters, if you want to call them that. You, you can have masters of knowledge, masters of a viewpoint, and they can, that is to say, they're natural, they're intellectually 
capable of even magnificently wielding information, knowledge, and so on. So they can be dazzling. But that doesn't mean you, you're going to get something from them. See? That is like another master. May have less of that, more of something else. If you're into glamour, then you go around glamorous teachers. If your ego is more Hollywoodish, then you find the Hollywood types of egos, you know, that are masters, so called, maybe real, maybe not, who knows. Uh, then you have a whole different level of masters, more silent, more invisible, disinterested, might be called a Varagi, or part of a Varagya system, detached from the world, not interested, absolutely not interested. And yet it's heartful, disinterested, but not dead, cold but heartfully disinterested. So it's like the opposite of the Bodhisattva. Right? Maybe a real Bodhisattva because it's opposite the Bodhisattva. So maybe it's true Bodhisattva, about Bodhisattva. Maybe true. Maybe the real one, the only one, who knows? So, so you have to feel that you're being served at, in a deep and beautiful way. In a unique way, perhaps, where it is clear the being is a channel, not interested even in what they're being, or what they're knowing, or what they're doing, or what they're saying. When you have that kind of transparency, maybe you have something. Who knows or what they're playing? Who knows? You have to decide that for yourself. If you feel peace, or if you smell shit. <laughs> if you smell shit, it may, it may be because the peace is so intense, you're not ready for it. <laughs> and so your own smell <laughs> is the shit you smell, because it's too peaceful for you. And yet it would seem that people can be persuaded to believe that shit s smells like flowers because yes. hey, everyone else is yes, saying yes, it, yes, it you say, so. No. One thing is important here, no money, no money works here. Okay? That's the kind of uh, system we have. No money. You're, you're not here because of your money or your donations or your tithing. You're here because you have no better place to be. This is profound. You're not here because there's a system or structure set in place for you. You're here because you heard something. You're here because you've seen something and you feel something. That's the criteria for being here. You're here because you're in agreement with something that is so deep, you have no other word to put on it but profound connection. And so you're here because like the wind is here, the air is here, the trees are here. It's because there's no other place to be. No other way to be but here. Here now. This is it. Here now. No knowledge, nothing else is going to qualify you for being here. And who knows, maybe it's an accident you're here. It's just a freak of nature. The, the, you, the wind just having to pick you up and blow you in here. <laughs> like a piece of paper. Maybe, and who knows, we make the most of it. Maybe we're two pieces of paper in here. Or if we're still blowing in the wind. <laughs> maybe we're still flying in the sky. I think we are, you know. <laughs> and so this ties then to the question of exploitation. Is a setting that requires uh, money or sex or something like that uh, in order for entrance uh, inherently false or, or could that No, be? that might be the way of the world. It might be necessary to do that. I mean, grace is very open space, man. Grace is open space. You know, I'm not suspicious of anybody. You know? I don't really have any interest in anybody. You know, that's the thing. You, know, you do what you do. You do what you do. And you better do what you have to do and you do what you do. As I, I'm here, so-called, the I is here, to do what it has to do, which is to live according to a certain kind of recognition or realization of it being the reality itself, uh, of no reality. It's just no reality. So, the reality of no reality, let's say. Call it what you want. I think, I think there's plenty of room there, but grace is open space. Right. Knowledge is spontaneous. It's genius, spontaneous. It knows itself as infinite, in a sense. And it's not because, 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 because of all the wonderful things it does. It's got nothing to do with that. It's not a because thing. It just is. Master is. It's not the master is because. No. That's your trip. That's the because is, is, is the chess game on the table for the self. It's the self game on the table. There's no because, it just is. If it is because, then it's because it is. It is because it is because it is, it is, whatever it is, it's something. So you, that means you can't change it. It's your feet on the ground right now, you're sitting 
You're in your body because that's how it is right now. You're looking at this, hearing it, because of it being the way it is. Now you have to deal with the way it is. If you have a problem with the way things is, that's your problem. If it is a problem, it could be the solution. If it is a solution, it could be the way it is. If it is the way it is, it may be that. Who knows? Who cares? Who goes? Who dares? Does one get closer to the Master simply by parroting his words, imitating his behavior, lifestyle, etc.? Does that get anyone... No, not necessarily. It may be helpful and useful to be familiar with certain things, but what helps you get closer to the Master is knowing what comes from the Master is what comes from the Master. Then that's a certification of truth, which is what you, as part of the soul level of consciousness, need to certify for yourself, that you know the truth, and you know the truth of other beings. So, if you start to know the truth of other beings, you start to know the truth of your own being. And then you receive accordingly. You receive as you give. You give credibility to the truth of other beings, you are also giving simultaneous truth to your own being, so to speak. Don't want to bring this down to a formula. It's not a formula. Just want you to make, be clear of a certain kind of karmic principle at play. So, oh, that comes from that master over there. Good. Uh, they play that kind of music. Good. Music here is very different, by the way. It's self. It's self-emerging. It's spontaneous, it's just the way it is. The idea is to get to that place where it's spontaneously so. Then you know what it is to be master without being a master. Then the thing itself happens. You have to open your unconscious to a degree where the creative, creative flow is self-existing, self-evident, and self-radiant. And who cares? Who knows? Can't tell anybody. Can't tell you anybody else more than that fact. You have to get to that, and the best way to get to that is to be around the being with being that, without trying to be anything to anybody. So, so you want to know what the trees are about? Put your head up against the trunk of a tree. You won't become a tree, but you can listen, feel it. Maybe if you're really open, you hug the tree, it might uh, hug you back. When it hugs you back, then you're you're being for sure. Does one reach a point of closure with the master? The, the worker relationship between them is done. And it can be done if you. It depends on what your agreement is. Uh, it depends on your agreement. If you have an agreement, it depends on your need. The idea of a master is to live a life that enables other people to participate in it spontaneously, with them recognizing and completely being responsible for what that master is doing, knowing, being, revealing, because a real master is a revelational force, power. It is always undoing itself. So it's always going beyond itself, because it doesn't have itself. So it's an open, open ceiling. So sky, so like a sky mind, sky mind, right? And so once you are in the presence of in the relationship to a company of such a process, intelligence, call it awareness, fire, I like call it fire perhaps, uh, then you start to feel the nature of it. Feeling the nature of it, since it's natural, it's no ego. Since there's no ego, it starts to appeal to your egolessness. Since it's egolessness and, and natural, then you start to grow in its ways to a certain degree, very naturally, without you thinking about it is already becoming you, you're becoming it, and before you know it, let us say, depending, you can be in yourself and still playing on the table, saying, oh, this is that, this is that. You can be glued to the chair, glued to the, the board, right? and not being able to get beyond that. So once you get off, get off it, right, and get up from it, and get away from it, then perhaps you can grow in accordance with what it really is. Not as you perceive it, not as you desire it, not as you wish it, right? Under your conditions, on your watch. So it's self-createdly speaking, but under its own, as you open to what it is, and its own reveals itself as it is to itself. It becomes self-evident, okay? obvious. Uh, Christianity and um, certain some other religions seem to be an attempt to develop a relationship with a dead master. Is this possible? Can it bring the same results as a relationship to a live master? Mm, no, it's not possible. That's why you don't see too many enlightened Christians out there. 
there's nobody kicking their ass in the right way. I don't mean that to be cruel. It's not a physical uh, kicking of the ass. What it means is it's keeping them in the fire. It's not happening. Because if you're going to be a real Christian, you can't be a Christian. <laughs> if you're going to be Christ, there's no Christianity. If you're going to be Christed, right, then you're going to be free. If you're going to be free, you're going to be crazy. If you're going to be crazy, you're going to be crucified. Fried. <laughs> you're going to be crucified. <laughs> So, it could be said that only until you're totally and completely crucified, <laughs> you're going to know what Jesus is about. Right? Really. And, uh, which is my point. Unless it happens to you, you're in a, you're in a nightmare. A wish-fulfilling dream. Nightmare. Hoping. Right? Believing. And that means persuading yourself. What? That you're going to what? What? When? Tomorrow, when you die, now is the reality. Now is the time. Yeah. Let tomorrow take care of tomorrow. Let now be what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't put off till tomorrow what needs to be done now, here, presently, in this moment. Yeah. Surrender your heart. Release it to what? Peacefulness, spirit. Not as you know it, but as it is. How do you get from what you know to what it is? It's not anybody's problem, is it? But, if and when that happens, nothing is the same anymore. You don't belong to anything or anyone in the same way anymore. You have entered a whole other universe. And, you know, goodbye to most people. <laughs> goodbye to most things. So, of your former self. Once you enter this kind of uh, fire and the real uh, space that it is, you are totally different. You're no longer subject, object. Who knows what you are at that point? Who cares? Who goes? Who dares? Uh, the story of Siddhartha seems to be one where a, uh, a being without a master meditated his way to enlightenment. Is that something that's possible? Can you comment on that? Enlightenment as a breakthrough experience can happen under any, any circumstances. Is it likely to happen? No. It's, but can it happen? Yes, it can happen. It can happen. Mm -hmm. At any time. And when it does, watch out. Relationships, watch out. Alright, watch out. So from that original experience, can, can people imitate that, so to speak? Uh, are people able to meditate their way to enlightenment in the same well, way? Well, you say, you, no, I'll put it differently for you. You can be meditated into enlightenment. Keep it at that. Can one find masters working within the traditions, or are they largely outside of the traditions? Well, we have to get away from the word master now, because it's, it's becoming a little bit of a trip. The heart is beyond tradition. The heart is present. Once we are able to recognize that the heart is the heart, and that is what it is, it's always present. And as one realizes that, there's no, no, no one and nothing else which is the master, but it's also the heart. Now we're using a different concept, and you see it, it comes back to the same thing, but again, we, we want to get off the board, the board of, of uh, moving for self-advantage. Right? And so it is a crazy wisdom paradox to understand that you can't understand anything. So don't try. Don't try to comprehend the incomprehensible. Yes, it's fun to do so. <laughs> right front. Carry on. Um, uh, let's shift from people maybe seeking enlightenment to just people seeking to understand themselves, have some degree of self-knowledge and sanity in the world. Um, is that an admirable goal? Is it preliminary to a search for enlightenment? Um, you know, that sort of thing. Repeat it uh, differently. Um, 
is, is there value in simply uh, taking steps to understand oneself as a being without any attempt to reach and Oh yes, everything is valuable, everything is necessary, everything is sacred. But it doesn't necessarily mean, because everything is sacred, that you're going to have this kind of enlightenment that is going to kind of fix you, fix you, solve all your problems. So we have to have the intuition of what a radical level of enlightenment is in terms of what the heart is and then try to sort out what we are doing to not be that on the spot. What games are we playing on the chessboard of ourselves, doing and undoing that is preventing us from having a profound recognition of the way the heart and what the master is in fact beyond appearances beyond thought, beyond self, beyond mind, beyond understanding, beyond practice, beyond any ritual or circumstance that you can consider a prop, beyond no props and all crutches. What is, what is left beyond all props and crutches? If you want to call it God, maybe you can call it God, maybe you can call it dog. You can call it, you know, odd, O-D, you can call it O. Let's call it O. Yeah. O. Zero. Or zero, right? Nero. <laughs> Whatever, oh, oh my goodness, right? Oh my, oh me, oh my, oh zero? Yes. Oh, who cares? Say, who knows? Oh. Say. So can one transcend their condition as an egoic being without first recognizing or in some way coming to terms with themselves as an egoic being. What do you think? I think it requires a certain amount of recognition of one's condition before one is able to get beyond one's condition. It's possible. And it's possible that uh, this event can happen without any anything going on whatsoever. Okay? I mean, if I use a personal uh, experience just without getting into any details. Yeah. Uh, this consciousness shifted from one state to another in a split second. And it just was like that. From, let's say, just to be educational, uh, from form to formlessness. Whereas before I saw it in terms of form and formlessness. It may have felt something relative to form and formlessness, and then without thought, without feeling or anything, I was form, formlessness, and neither. Forever. And now, who knows? Uh, you don't seem to have any interest in things uh, that are found in a lot of traditions, such as hierarchies, uh, orders, holidays, sacred objects, uh, all these types of things that, that seem to enter into uh, established religions or established spiritual cultures. Uh, can you comment on your, um, let's say, disinterest in those types of things? We say disinterest, but that's after the fact. Prior to the fact, whatever that means, Oh, everything was, was valuable. Everything is sacred. Everything was pointing in the direction, say, towards this kind of thing. This uh, event, we, we'll call it right now the great reversal or the great disappointment, the great embarrassment, the great insult, whatever you want to call it. Right? And so all of it was, was sacred. Why would it be any less sacred now for some? It's all sacred. See? And so it's not what it is, but who uses it and how it's used. It's that simple. We can't say it's enlightenment or unenlightenment, really. Who knows at this point? But once a certain event happens, everything is sacred and nothing is sacred anymore. And that's the only way it can be. And that's maybe a difficult place to be. But that's it, this is the way the heart is, and so, at the same time, I can't hurt a fly. I don't know why. I just have, have no desire to hurt a fly. Nothing, nothing proved to a fly. 
Nothing against a fly. So there you have it. So this is not a, this is not an intellectual recognition. This is definitely a heart thrusted process. Okay. We don't want to even call it compassion. Call it uh, heart radiance, heart fire sound. Who knows? Again, yeah. it's transcendent, it's beyond description, and with all due respect, that has to be recognized for what it is at some point. Somehow, you get to that. Everyone is the point, but not consciously yet. I can understand not wanting to hurt a fly. If a mosquito lands on you and is about to make a meal of some of your blood, is it the same condition, or do you swat and kill that mosquito? If I swat and kill that mosquito, I swat and kill myself. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's happening anyway. <laughs> what is that again? Or lose by a mosquito? Or a human passing? <laughs> or entering the dimension? Who cares? Who knows? We have to get back to that point. Not a point of morality relative, <laughs> relative to if it's good or bad to swat a mosquito is not the issue. Is it good or bad to live or die is the issue. And how? That's the issue. What is the level of quality of your life that you want to work from? That's the issue. We can't get into the possibility of swatting or not swatting a fly or killing or not killing men when we have to work on a heart level of consciousness and then one, one knows what to do at that point. And then when you get to the point of the event of this kind of embarrassment, reversal, or this great profound disappointment, there's nobody there to be concerned one way or other. But I'm saying to you that there's no impulse to hurt a fly. There's no impulse to hurt anybody. So the heart is present. Call it what you want, it is present. It allows grace to all beings. It is present. Maybe I'm an idiot. Maybe I don't know anything. Psycho. But the heart is present it's in the form of compassion, perhaps love, mercy, and granting that to all beings. That's a fact. Uh, sure, I can fight, probably kick someone's ass if I had to. Uh, but I don't think I'd be angry enough to make it a poisonous event. It'd have to be something else. Okay. It'd have to be something else. Uh, can my body be used to do that for a higher purpose? Absolutely. And I hope it is used for a higher purpose. But right now that's hypothetical. I'm trying to give you insight into a dimension that is absolutely incomprehensible, which is great. You know that. Yeah. So, so in a sense you're talking about, uh, let's say, if, if a so-called violent act occurs minus the psychic violence behind it with no violence in, in, the, in the being of the person, uh, it's not necessarily a violent act. Could be. Could be. Uh, maybe a star that's exploding or planets in collision is not a violent act. Maybe the earthquake is not a violent act. Maybe a tornado is uh, damage is not a, as a result of a violent act, so-called. Maybe a volcanic explosion is not because of any kind of indigestion. You know, it's not a stomach problem. It's not, you know, a problem at all. Yeah. Maybe the universe is no problem. Uh, many religions, uh, spiritual cultures, whatever, use uh, symbols, let's say sacred symbols, the most obvious being the Christian cross. Um, is there a value to, let's say, a symbolic language which seems to exist out there? Well, all communication can do is maybe present symbology for relative comprehension of what is being communicated which is always relative to who and what. So a cross could open your consciousness. Uh, hit, getting hit over the head with a cross could open your consciousness even more. <laughs> right? Being sent to a hospital in critical condition might be you know, your key to peace. Okay? Which is what happens on the combat, in, in the combat. And people have these catastrophic uh, situations where they're shot and they enter a domain of peace. And he's wondering, man, how, why did it take this? In former reincarnations, in my own case, I know that was the case, where I experienced peace in battle. So, wow, oh, this is not really battle. This is really a form of peace. How so? How can that be? 
It's like a dance. So having realized the true nature of the dance beyond form, the dance beyond end, ah, key, the dance beyond end, the dance beyond death, that's a very good point to get to. Beyond death, the beyond death, no death point of recognition, realization, or being beyond death. Even though everything is dying, you can still be beyond death. How so? How is it possible to have insight into one's previous incarnations? It arises, like how can you remember yesterday? It's not something you have to try to do. If you're trying to do it, it's not there. It just is. Okay. Just don't believe it. When you're there, you know. Don't believe it or disbelieve it. Don't say it doesn't exist. Don't say it does exist. Let it be what it is. It's not a big deal. What is a big deal is what you're believing and not believing. That's a big deal. Because you're, then you're playing with a chessboard. Um, it seems we, we are in a, a state uh, or, or an age where we have access, let's say, to a term that's been used, spiritual supermarket. Uh, there's all kinds of spiritual cultures and, and uh, possibilities to, uh, to sort through and choose among. Mm. So for somebody who's, who's feeling spiritual impulses within themselves, seeking something more, knowing there is something more, but not having a clue as to how to begin, do you offer any advice for such an individual? Mm. What is well, I in the spiritual system? Well, you, you have the world, the perception of the world, and you can call it spiritual, you can call it supermarket, or whatever you want. Uh, that's just your material perception. To go back to a very fundamental and critical question. You know, you don't know, you're free or you're not free. And then what do you, where do you work from? What, is, what are you motivated by? What is moving you to do what you do? That's what you need to do. What is moving you? That's the question. And that's the technique. What is moving you? You might call that self-inquiry, which has a basis in some of this. You may need to question why you're questioning. So that means you're starting to retrace your steps. How'd you get here? Okay. Go, go back to where you came from, if you can. And that's why they make references. Who were you before you, you were born? Okay. What was, what was it, your face before you were born? Okay. And these kinds of questions, which are not really questions, they're answers. They have real answers. So we reach the point now in the conversation where only the question is the answer. Uh, can you talk a little bit about freedom um, in the sense that uh, freedom is more important than, let's say, making correct choices or uh, even living? Uh, correct choices? No, freedom is making the correct choice. Right, that is freedom is making the correct choice. Now, that's profound. Think about that. <laughs> if you can make the correct choice, whatever the hell that is, you're free. If you're free, you will always make the correct choice. Yeah. So, so for those around us, let's see, we, we see somebody on a uh, self-destructive, so-called self-destructive uh, path, um, do we simply recognize their freedom to do so and let them be in that condition? You don't have any choice. You don't have any choice. What do you do? You see a, a comet coming. You're going to get in front of it? What for? Right? It's up to you. You want to, you want to put yourself in a position of a back truck coming down the road? You do that. You have to take what comes with that. You, know, it's, you don't want to get in anyone's way, whether it's your kids or your parents' way. That's not the enlightened way unless that's your, your enlightened way, and you, and you do that to take what comes with it as part of your experience, your reality. So. And yet there are people from all kinds of uh, spiritual cultures who proselytize, who want to share, this has been good for but you. Have, you and, and then, in the same, by the same token, you, you may be free enough not to participate, because they're doing what they feel they have to do, just like you are, doing what you feel you have to do. Neither are good or bad, they just are programs. They're programs. When you are beyond programs, none of this as such arises with any gravity. Yeah, so it's good to hear 
that, well, what people are experiencing spiritually, materially, or egoically, or even selflessly is programming. Programming. So would we say then, well, that, that individual is free to, uh, to walk in front of the bus, they don't see his coming at them, uh, but would we also say, well, I'm free to pull him out of the way, or yell, or... Uh... You do what you have to do. So you're free to suffer your lessons, uh, you're free to act, and when you're free, you are free to act freely. And that means without consequence, because then something deeper than your ego is acting. And that's what's important, is to act from what is deeper than yourself. That's why it's important to be in a position where you are able to go beyond yourself, recognizing yourself as some kind of facade, some kind of superficial programming that is not worthy of your life. It has to be seen as unworthy of your life, unworthy of your energy, unworthy of your time and space, your matter, your being, unworthy of it. Bullshit, right? You're unworthy of bullshit. If you feel you're worthy of bullshit, then so be it. So, so it seems, in a, in a sense, uh, trying to distinguish between compassion and indifference and neutrality and these don't same. views. Don't, don't think yourself to death. They're, they're all the same. They're just views. Once you enter a state, then you do what you do because it is what it is. And there are no mistakes. <laughs> it's hard to believe that. There are no mistakes. There, then you enter the realm of the impeccable level of free action. There are no mistakes. No regrets as such. And each one at heart is capable of that. So it would seem then it's uh, uh, important or useful to come to terms with one's nature so one knows when one is acting truthfully or coherently and when one is acting out some outside influence or, you know, presumption of this is the way I should conduct myself, you know. One hopes so. One hopes so. You can hope so, right? Even though it's better to be hopeless, you can hope so. Why is it better to be hopeless? Why, why is it good to be hopeful? seems to hold promise some for the future. Well, the security is already the chessboard maneuvering. Yeah. If you're present, you're beyond concern. You are fully confident in what is. If you work from that, what have you to fear? What have you to doubt? What have you to be confused about? What could be a problem? What could go wrong? So, so given that, um, why, wouldn't, why wouldn't one simply always choose comfort over anything other than comfort? There is no comfort. It's a, it's a perception. What you're talking about is self-serving chess playing. So you comfort, your, your idea of comfort and choosing comfort is choosing pain. That's your way of keeping up with your discomfort. <laughs> it's very discomforting to, to be too comfortable. <laughs> Who knows that better than you? Comfort is very discomforting because it's too transitory. You can't keep up with it. How long is your comfort going to last? That being the truth of it, comfort is discomforting. So it doesn't exist. What? Right? It doesn't exist. For who? Exactly, for who? See, so it's a program. It's a cover. It's a hidden program. It's a program of hiding, masking. So. I guess relative to that, I'm trying to understand why somebody might choose a bed of nails over a futon, you know. Again, it, it, it is what is poison to one is medicine to the other. It's hard to judge by appearances why and to what degree anyone is experiencing what. So, whether it's eating glass 
or having a glass of beer, who cares? It's not about that. Who cares about others to that point where you're suffering? Others, rather than realizing otherlessness, realizing relationlessness, realizing the inconceivable radiance that is enabling your perceptions to exist. I guess I'm trying to understand relative to that. Uh, therefore, if one institutionalizes suffering as a positive, for example, people who might wear thorns under their clothes to emulate the suffering of others, so on, there are spiritual traditions where this is, this is valued. Yes, go ahead. So is, is there value in entering a tradition of suffering as opposed to discovering it from one moment to the next in one's own condition? Oh, there's value to everything, relatively speaking. Everything is sacred, relatively speaking. Your pain, your miseries, all of it leads to the next thing, which could lead beyond, you see? It could lead beyond. The idea is to be open. Be open to what is beyond what you're experiencing as relative perception or whatever. And thus, increase your capability of knowing the potential by knowing that what is coming to you and showing up in your mind as your mind is not the reality, but what appears to be the reality. What is temporarily preoccupying you with some kind of relative perception of yourself. You are perceiving yourself. So once you get tired of perceiving yourself as self, then you have to understand that there's more space. Open more beyond your relative perception of self-perception and get into the space of space. The heart space, infinite space, no space. Get into the no space of space and be at peace with that. See? If you can, right? If you can, try. I'll try. Try to be at peace with the space of no space. Okay. Hugh.